Tim, thank you for joining me today. How are you? I'm all right. Good deal. I'm excited to have a conversation with you again. I think this is number three, maybe four mm-hmm. that you've been on. No, I think three. three. Um, yeah. So I'm excited to dive in and have another conversation and um, kind of flip it a little bit and have you ask me some questions as well as we get going. Um, just to really like really dive into how like the mental side of things, but also the physical side of things when it comes to training and putting in the work and recovering and doing things properly. So, um, but before we dive into that, I know you've introduced yourself, but tell us a little bit more again, who are you? Yep. So uh, I'm a performance psychologist and my company is called Impact Being. And what we try to do is to create people who can be, not just do. And we, uh, you know, our goal is to have people who have an impact, not just win gold medals. Um, And quite frankly, one of the reasons for that all thing being an, an impact is because it really is hard to reach the top, top, top elite if you aren't really aware of your impact and you're not doing it from a place of being you're doing it from a place of doing it's rare if ever that you really get there so um it's kind of like uh i'm gonna make sure that we succeed by focusing you in the right direction of impact and being and so then we called the company impact being (laughs) <laughs> um, and you know, we're starting to get content out there and all, so th- we're really excited for, for that. I'm also an OCR athlete on the age group level. Um, I've been injured for a while, but, uh, before that I was competing at pretty high levels and I have my sights set on 2023 worlds is my ultimate goal right now in the 50 plus age group. Awesome. 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 Um, and I, I'm excited to see, I've talked to you a number of times. I'm excited to see your impact being content and company really coming to fruition because I think it's going to help a ton of people, um, myself included, based on what it covers and just the, like all the mindset work and everything that's, that's in there. So I'm excited to kind of, to really see that get out there. Cool. Yeah. It's exciting because it's all based on neurophysiology. And so we feel like we're in a better position and unfortunately, a unique position in the market, which is ludicrous. It should not be unique at all. Everything should be based on the mechanisms underlying it, not people's opinions, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, that, I think what draws me to your work is how much you're consistent with all of the work I do. You start with the, I always tell my athletes, think like your body, not an athlete. And you really do think like your body. You don't think like an athlete. Um, and I love it. And I just I go gaga over that. Awesome. <laughs> well, that kind of leads into what we um, wanted to start off this conversation with, um, which is what you call pre-work work and post-work. Um, I would love for you to dive into what what that means for you, how that's like, what that looks like in, in someone's life too. Yeah. So let me back up a second. Cause we're also going to talk about progressions, which is the, the big point, but um, too, but so let me back up one second. And that is uh, you could call them frameworks. You could call them schemata. You could call them associative networks, neurons connected to neurons, but basically what's mapped in into your long-term memory file. And often you might not even be aware of what's mapped in. What's mapped in comes out in three ways, emotionally, behaviorally, and perceptually. And so the reason New Year's resolutions miss the mark often is because people try to change their behavior and don't try to change their mapping. So if you change the mapping, the behavior just changes automatically. And then you don't need new, your New Year's resolution should be to learn a lot about whatever it is I'm trying to do. If you're trying to cut weight, learn a lot about it. And I have a whole thing on uh, the psychology of nutrition because it's really about knowledge and, and mapping and stuff like that. And then you don't have to diet and do dumb things and, and all that. But um, so what we're trying to do in this podcast, like anything I do really is try to put the right mindset framework 
associative network. We're trying to change the mapping so that what follows it is right, you know? Um, and so that's what we're really trying to do here. And so when we talk about, you know, pre-work, work, post-work, it's going to be like, okay, I get it. But that doesn't mean the listener mapped it in. Until they map it in, they're not going to, it's not going to have an effect. They might get it, but it doesn't have the effect. Mm -hmm. Same with progressions. If you don't see things through the lens of progressions, you get it, but it's not mapped in. And so you're not going to, it's not going to affect you. And that's what we want to do. We want to have it affect you. So you might need to listen to a couple parts of this multiple times just to map it in. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're good. Awesome. And you and I have been through a lot of uh, education, right? So we spent a lot of years mapping stuff in. And then that's how we can affect ourselves and affect others, right? Because we have the knowledge. So it's really knowledge, not the practice as much. Knowledge creates better process, creates better outcome. So that's what you and I are trying to do today is to impart that knowledge, but it's up to the listener to map it in. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. I feel like so. it's very much like those, like, I love to read. I read a lot of personal development books, business books, fitness books, like you name it to learn. And like a lot of it, then it's like, I like conceptualize, figure out how I can integrate that into my life or if it needs to be integrated. But I feel like kind of what you're talking about is like what a lot of people do as far as like read the book for the purpose of reading the book and the end I read it. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And you get a point or two, action. <laughs> right? You get a point or two and it feels like something happened, but we don't know if it really mapped in or not. And you don't know what's been mapped in against your will. I mean, racism exists, right? No one's like, Hey, let's be racist, but it's, it's stuff people, the society yeah. put in our personhood and it got mapped in and we might even be unaware of it. In fact, we might hate racism and still possess racist mapping right and there's a thing where we don't even want it we don't even agree and we still have it and so changing that mapping is really what it's about and listening for the faulty mapping is what we want and so you know you've internalized it when you can hear faulty mapping mapping happen right because it's the old mapping the bad mapping still there mm -hmm. and so that's when it's like oh i hear you bad mapping go away, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> you're easier to hear it when you have the good mapping in there alongside it. <laughs> so how, on that note, how do we start like, and it, you know, we may, like you say, we may not even realize that bad mapping is in there, but how do we start to change that mapping in our brain? Maybe like go back to that nutrition standpoint that you were talking, that you kind of started with example wise, like, how do we start changing the mapping in our brain to like, this is the better lifestyle to be living? There's so many answers to that, but I'm going to start with one that you, the audience could like in, import immediately, which is try to differentiate what, what I'm, trust me, loosely calling. I don't hold me to this completely, but what I'm loosely, what I loosely call solutions versus strategies. So um, the strategy right now I'm using because I need to go to bed at nine and I get up at 4 a.m. to get some of the company stuff done before I go to my nine to five job is this is a strategy. I, I say no, no three F's after eight, no food, no fun, no phone. <laughs> and so I know it's like 730 is okay. I better get my, whatever I'm going to eat for today, the last bit better get it now. I better like check my phone and dance around on Instagram if I want, because I'm running out of time. Whatever fun I'm going to have, get it in now. And then eight o'clock hits and I get things ready for the next day. I take the dog for a walk. I feed the pets. I do all that busy work and I'm in bed by nine, nine fifteen, something like that. Right. That's a strategy. That that's not, I don't plan on doing that forever. Um, I don't want to do that forever. I don't even want to do it now. Um, but just because you heard someone do that doesn't mean you should do that. It's a strategy. Does that strategy work for you? But a solution is, for example, 
I won't work with someone on nutrition if they can't do the first step. And this is where we get into progressions and pre-work, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But there's an example of all three, a solution, pre-work, and progression. I won't even talk about the psychology. Here's the psychology of nutrition, which is um, you have to give me a, um, what do you call it? Um, A maintenance meal plan that is joyful and easy to nail every single day. If you can't give me that, we're not talking about anything else, right? I won't talk to someone about anything else. So a joyful meal plan that is absolutely easy to do every day. That hits, the third part is that hits all your macros. Mm -hmm. That's a solution. Right. Because if you don't know your maintenance meal plan, how are you going to then do a cut or or a build? How are you going to adjust your meal plan according to your hardest work effort versus your off day? How are you going to adjust if you have to eat out one night? Like you have nothing to adjust from because you don't even know your maintenance, joyful meal plan. And if it's a struggle and you hate it, and you don't like what you're eating, you're not going to do it. It's not joyful. Right. So that's a solution. That's not a strategy. You can't skip that. (laughs) Like that's real hitting your macros joyful and easy to do. Um, So that's an example of differentiate solution versus strategy. That'd be a kind of mindset to have, you know, and, and there's, you know, process versus outcome. Process versus outcome, that's a solution, not a strategy. Are you being process focused right now or are you focused solely on outcome? If you're focused on outcome, that's going to be shame and judgment and panic and all this stuff. If you're process focused, calm, determined, uh, compassion shows up. So we view process as a solution, which is my CERT model that I do with athletes, not a strategy. Positive thinking can work and cannot, but that's a strategy. Use positive thinking the night before, but I'm 20 months away from worlds. I'm not going to use positive thinking. I'm going to be like, oh crap, there's like talented people in Europe and they're practicing every day and they're going to crush me, right? That's very negative, but that's a strategy because I'm so far away from it. Mm -hmm. But the closer you are to it, the strategy switches to positive focus. But positive talk is not a solution. And I think it's so hard to just kind of think of that positive talk thing, like, because we all have good and bad training days. We all have those days that we just like feel we did horribly. And then we go on social media and we see our competitors just doing awesome. And like, it's hard to be positive on those days. Yeah. And that should scare the hell out of you. And that's okay. I just saw a time a guy in my age group put up and I was like, Whoa, that that's a legit time. He would have finished like top 10 in the pro heat. That's my competitor. Yeah. That's legit. Right. I should feel scared about that. That's accurate. So how accurate are you? Or are you just worried? You know, um, own it. I got work to do to beat that dude. Mm -hmm. And I think ownership is huge on things, you know, what in your training, in your goals, in, in everything. Like if you can own your mistakes, you can own your wins, you can own your goals. I think it's a lot more the process is a lot more positive, a lot more fruitful. Yeah, it is. And that's process oriented. It's like, I own it, but I got work to do over the next 20 months, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And people say, well, aren't you wimping out if you don't shoot for this year? Well, it's not that I'm not shooting for it. It's that I really don't think because I'm coming off a two-year injury, I don't think I have enough time to get to that that kind of really high altitude level. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if I have enough time. It's not that, and that's my body. That's thinking like my body. Do I have enough time to build that many mitochondria in my cells? Do I have to, 
You know what I mean? These are legit things. My, my cells don't care about the date. They're just like, <laughs> Hey, we only produce this much mitochondria so quickly. Um, may, if I am, I'm going to go for it and I'm going to go there and try to take no prisoners. But you know, I don't, I don't know how realistic that is based mm-hmm. on time. Yeah. And I think we can dive into a little bit more of that discussion as we get a little bit further when we're talking about the progressions that we want to talk about too. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of transitioning to that, um, kind of leading into the progressions, the pre-work, um, <laughs> starting conversation, um, like what, in your, in your mind, in your, in your work, like, what does that look like? Or what is that? Yeah. So let's talk. I always, in when I teach a class, I talk about what it isn't first. Cause I find that that pedagogically, that just is a really useful technique. So when I first got into OCR, I was like, okay, I need grip strength. I need to do massive amount of pull-ups. And I just started doing massive amount of pull-ups, grip strength stuff and blah, blah, blah. And what, and same with running, run hard, run far, run fast, run uphill, downhill, just try to be great. Well, what I've seen happen with me and with many other people like me, um, and I don't think it's just age, though someone could claim it's age, is that I was crashing towards injuries because I hadn't built micro muscles. I, haven't, I didn't build support muscles. I built focused on macro muscles, if that's the right word, I don't even know, but like the big muscles. Um, I didn't focus on chain building. In fact, I blew up my North American world championships. I was in third place and my psoas muscle seized up and there went my race because I hadn't been training complex compound movements enough. And so these chains weren't talking and my psoas blew up and then you can't do anything without your core. So there went that. And so, you know, I might be able to claim right now that I was the North American champion in in 19, it was, but I can't, right. I I barely finished the race. Um, Those were things that were, I was crashing towards. Why? Because I didn't build progressions. I didn't build from the ground up. I just went for the big things, the noticeable things. If I, and so I reached out to you because I said, I have all this knowledge and I'm going to do it right. And you are going to do it with me (laughs) (laughs) and you are going to build me up like a bionic person from the ground up from the, from, and literally you started with my big toe. Like talk about who the hell trains their big toe. Right. And you're like, nope, your your tripod, your big toe, your pinky toe and your heel. We're going to start with your tripod. That is an example of progression. That is an example of pre-work. That's an example of thinking like your body, not an athlete, because I never had done that stuff. And I reached a high level. Right. I've, I want to I won an age group in the sprint, super and beast level. So in some really competitive races like Palmerton, but I was probably crashing towards an injury at any point um, because I hadn't built up those other things. So that's, that's an example of what isn't and what is right. And so I said, okay, how long do I need to do pre-work? And that's where we get into, there's always, if you're going to wash your kitchen floor, there's pre-work, you have to move everything out of the way. There's the work, you do the mopping, and then the post-work, you clean up the mop, put everything back, right? Well, you said, okay, you need two months of pre-work. And I thought, there's no way you're going to be marketable on this. This is a terrible business plan. If, if I hadn't come to you, right? Think of how frustrated an athlete would be. And trust me, I was doing, folks, I was doing 45 minutes a day of foot strengthening, ankle strengthening, the most boring things you could ever imagine. But I knew definitively how important they were. And man, I didn't rush any of those progressions. That's a mantra we use in impact being never rush your progressions. 
So now you folks already should have three things already starting to map in. You have solutions and strategies, you have pre-work, work and work, and you have never rush your progressions. And so they, they weren't as boring as I mean, and Brin's, Brienne's not boring, but, uh, but I knew this was important. And so it didn't matter. I was going to do it every day. And I just, whatever you said, I did, you know, and that's all an example of that kind of stuff. Now I was going from injury, so that's all I could do. <laughs> but had I been the healthiest athlete ever, I would have, that's all I would have done if you said it, you know, and I'm not rushing it. When you say right now you have me running halves and at seven minutes, in other words, run a half and then don't run again until the seven minutes clock hits and then start your next half. I do that like to the second, right? Because I don't know why you're having me do that. I'm not you. I don't have all the knowledge you have, but I trust your mapping. And so if it comes out of your head and says, do this, I know there's a thousand reasons to do it. And I do it exactly as you say, because I'm not going to rush my progressions. Nor am I going to be frustrated by that and think, oh, I'm so far away from my ultimate goal. I used to run, you know, 15 miles like nothing and do these blistering sprint workouts and now i'm like lamely running halves at like nine ten minute you know what i mean i'm so lame right now and it's like that's all right one step at a time exactly um and something i want to bring attention to and is what you said as far as like you realize now that you were just kind of an injury waiting to blow up at some point. And we talked, I think pre-recording that like most athletes, that's where they are because they do Mm -hmm. all those bigger muscle group trainings. They do isolated movements. They just, just run or just strength train, never combine them together. Like there's a lot of things that go on with training that I see as faults. Um, and because they don't do that base, because they're not necessarily doing those fine tuned things, those detailed things, um, they are just injuries waiting to happen, which in my opinion is why we see so many injuries in, in all sports. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're listening and you want to be an elite or like a top age grouper and you don't work with a really good physical therapist who can know the mechanics of your body. Well, you're kidding yourself. Um, it's just ridiculous to skip that. And I've worked with great coaches. Rich Ryan is an amazing coach. I would, you know, shower him with praise any day of the week. Um, And in addition to that, though, I was always looking for a PT person. And they're just on, I've worked with a lot of PTs and they're, they're just, they don't get it from the ground up. So my question to you is like, why do you think you get it from a tripod, big toe on up when I hate to say it, but your field is lacking terribly in, in that kind of like, don't rush your progression, start with the base progression. Um, What happened to your field that they don't think like you and, or why are you an anomaly? Why do you think like you, right? Because you do it correctly. (laughs) Why do I think like me? That's a great question. Um, (laughs) No, like I totally agree with you. There are like, I feel like our, my profession as physical therapy profession is doing a lot of people a disservice just because there is so much stuff being missed. Um, You know, as a, most physical therapy schools, it's like you go, you get like the quote unquote general education to be able to treat every body part, but then you get out and you're also limited by the insurance companies, what they'll allow. And so, um, you, you can only do so much with that said, I feel like there's a lot of steps that are missed in the process, you know, just talking about progressions and doing things right. I think there's a lot of missed progressions in, in education and physical therapy. Um, the first one being like, we stand on our feet, like, that's what we stand on. It's what we walk on. It's what we run on. It's what we do everything on in a upright position. 
But for most, most of the time, it's not until someone has a foot injury that someone may start addressing the foot. And even when they are, it's all these cookie cutter exercises of like, oh, let's do some toe, some towel scrunches. Let's just do some single leg balance. No one's teaching people or most clinicians aren't teaching people like, how am I actually supposed to be standing? Mm-hmm. Because we spend 20, 30, 40 years of our life compensating for all these other injuries we had when we were teenagers that we just put ice on and went out the door because we're resilient and invincible at that age. Mm -hmm. And so we spend these years compensating, not knowing how we're actually supposed to be on our foot, which then just causes downward spiral of issues. Um, So first and foremost, like we need a solid foundation to stand on that foot. And then from there, it's really looking at movement and figuring out like, can someone even stand on a single leg? Like if they can't balance on a single leg with good foot control, how are you going to walk? How are you going to run? How are you going to go up and down stairs? And it's really just figuring out like what movement pattern, like what's the next movement pattern that has to happen for this person to achieve that next functional step. Yeah. And you know, you first had me doing that stuff and I was terrible and it's, it seems so easy, right? But um, the, the, the trunk rotation, the head rotation to trunk rotation and all that. Now, like, I feel so badass when I do that. I, I'll like that. I incorporated a lot of that into my warm up in the gym. And so I'm standing there and I'm just doing it. And I'm thinking, there is not a person in this gym who can nail this right now. <laughs> as, as much as I'm just standing somewhere doing like this kind of foot training stuff. I feel more badass doing that than, you know, doing some kind of heavy deadlift, hex bar deadlift or something. Cause like, yeah, I know a lot of people are doing hex bar deadlift, but no one can do what I just did standing on one foot. Probably true. <laughs> and now, and, but, but every week, every, every couple of weeks, there's this progression up and I'm like, oh man, she was heading me to that. That's even more badass. It's so exciting, like watching the next progression because it's just crazy. Now I'm doing a RDL, a diagonal RDL, you know, um, cross plane RDL. And it's totally bad. And I'm like, there's no one in the gym who could do this right now. (laughs) (laughs) It's great. And, you know, kudos to you. I mean, I had plantar fat, I had, had what's quote, a, a, you know, severe plantar fasciitis. The MRI came back, multiple partial tears, severe plantar fasciitis, debilitating injury, really. And I'm running again. And that only took a little while, two months max. And I was already running after not running for almost two years without any help from all the PT and stuff I went to. So, it's it folks it, it's just simple you got to start at the base and build your way up and i would implore athletes and and i'll send athletes i work with this podcast because it's like if you think you're too good to do these base things then you're too good then you think you're too good <laughs> you know it's going to destroy your chances of ever becoming elite because eventually you're going to hurt you're going to get hurt uh, you didn't build up these support muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, all that stuff. And tendons and ligaments are one trick ponies, right? I, I, you know more than me, but I think they're like one trick ponies, right? Whenever <laughs> I've injured a ligament, it's like I couldn't do one thing, oh, but I could gosh. do a lot of other things. Yes. You know what I mean? But I just couldn't do that one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I tore a ligament in my wrist and I couldn't do push ups, but I could do everything else. I could even do push ups on my fist. But I couldn't do a regular push up. That was the only thing I couldn't do. <laughs> it's like, so you got to know how to work this stuff to get those one trick ponies in shape. Well, and even think, you know, as you're talking, I'm reflecting back to kind of the things we did. Like, even think of the progressions we did to make sure you were okay to run again. Like, mm-hmm. everything we did, like making sure you could land on that single leg solidly when it's the quick reaction, making sure you could. Um, and how we progressed you back to being able to sure you were safe to jump again and, 
and yep. land and all that stuff. Like they all had their little steps to make sure we could get from point A to point Z safely. Yep. It, it, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I remember <laughs> every one of those. At 5 a.m. in my, in my bedroom, sitting there doing these little land things and different things. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, now if I could do it all over again, if I could work with some of you athletes out there and we could start from scratch, I would say take a year or take, you know, if it was, if it's, oh, let's say April 1st and your world's, your big race was September, October, November, you might need six weeks of pre-work, you know, so build up scapular strength. Don't just jump right to uh, pull-ups. Uh, build up shoulder strength, build up these, you know, whatever your PT or whatever your trainer would say, take some time, do that pre-work first, build up the surrounding tissue, build, know how to do that stuff and then progress into the work, mm -hmm. you know, right. Um, but folks come to you when they're injured. Yes. They should come to you. Okay. I'm ready for pre-work. And now you don't stop there. You can do the work with them. You're a very good trainer. So I don't want to cut you short on your business because you're now my trainer too. But uh, so you can be a good trainer, but I would ask, I, I can imagine you would run your business into the ground if you insisted on people starting at the first step, the base model, the pre-work. They'd be like, she is, the exercises were a bit boring at times. Like they were too simple. Wine, wine, wine. Everyone suck it up, buttercup. Stop whining. You just sound like a whiner. <laughs> do, the, do the pre work. What? It's so critical. You know, it's really interesting you say that because I'm like, I have a guy I'm working with now, um, OCR guy, and kind of just like you were saying, he just wanted to get better. He wasn't injured, um, but he did have occasional like, foot and shoulder stuff going on. And I remember a message I got from him shortly after, like maybe one or two weeks in, like doing just basic foot stuff. He's like, I did not realize how my feet could not work. And mm -hmm. like a couple of weeks ago, or just like a week ago, he sent me a message. He's like, I can't believe how much better my stronger, my shoulders are feeling and my feet are feeling and how much faster I'm running and how like all this stuff. And like, it just goes to show, like when you do the work that progress, like that pre-work, how much of a difference it makes and how people perform. You know that. I know that. How do we get the world to wake up to pre-work as an essential component? Because anything people do, and I know I work with college students a lot, right? And they want to they write the paper and it's like, wait, you got to do pre-work. Or an artist, they want to write the book. Wait, you got to do pre-work. And they're like so frustrated. They feel like pre-work just slows them down. It's like, no, that is a phase of the work cycle. Yeah. You, you can't, you're looking at a stairwell and you're looking at step 10 and you're like, I have no time for step one through nine. Sorry, suck it up, buttercup. There's steps <laughs> one through nine. You can't just get to step 10. You can't reach it. <laughs> Just do the first step, right? And it's like, we yeah. don't think that way because we want to do the badass. We want the end product. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and personally, I think there's not enough people talking about that pre-work, that base building stuff. Like as clinicians, I do know several who do post about it, but for the most part, you look at the elite athletes, you look at the amateur athletes posting workouts online and it's all the like awesome stuff they did in the workout. Very few are talking mm -hmm. about the preventative stuff they're doing, the pre-work, the, all that accessory stuff. Maybe they're not. No, you know, who, are, you but know they who do. does the, the world champions do. I've seen Lindsay and Lindsay Webster, who's a OCR world champion and mm -hmm. Nicole Miracle, who's coming off a torn MCL or ACL, whatever it was, uh, and a former world champion. They both post their pre-work. Yep, you're right. Right? So, and you know what? At the end of the day, if I do win a world at, at the age group level, 
I don't want to be applauded for my badass mountain workouts. I want to be you. I want to be like, listen, I sat there for 45 minutes for eight weeks in a row doing toe strengthening stuff. Like, that's what I want credit for, because that was totally badass and it was hard. <laughs> it seriously is running hard. up a mountain like that. Nothing. I can do that anytime. I can do that all day long. Um, no, the, what I need credit for is the other stuff. So the real, the real, and, and in my stage model, I developed for athletes, the first three stages are kind of the amateur stages. And one of the defining factors of the amateur stage is they focus on what I call high profile things, running up a mountain, big squat, the elite professional athlete last three stages the difference is they focus on low profile things strengthening your big toe um you know and that's what really differentiates that's what keeps amateurs amateurs and that's the dividing line of turning elite is you do all those minutia low profile things and they're obsessed with it mm -hmm. and, and that's a great point um that because that is a big separator for people um, so some of it may go unseen by the elites, but it's definitely the big separator is putting in that extra work of that fine tuned stuff. Yeah. And you look at Emma Colburn, uh, Olympic gold medalist in the steeplechase, uh, Kipchoge, you know, world record holder for marathon, any of these people mm -hmm. look at Kipchoge do, uh, do his slow run. They're like nine, 10 minute miles. I mean, it is so ridiculously slow because he's just building mitochondria. Mm -hmm. That's the only point of it. It's scarily slow. It's funny, my brother, so he's, he's a lot faster than I am. He's an ultra runner, a lot faster than I am. And a couple of years ago, we were both at my dad's for, I think it was Thanksgiving, maybe Christmas. And he's like, hey, bring your running shoes along. We can do a run together. And I was like, um you're a lot faster than I am. He's like, no, he's like, I take my slow run seriously. I was like, all right, good to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can keep up and, with you then. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's where it's at. Cause you're just building, you know, what's the purpose of it that you're building mitochondria. Right. Mm -hmm. And so talk about a map when I'm on a slow run, I'm just like here to build mitochondria. I'm not here to huff and puff and do all these things. Um, get my heart rate up. I'm here to build mitochondria. So I have the mapping of what that means. And then that's what comes out emotionally, behaviorally, and perceptually. I don't feel slow. I don't feel frustrated. I don't lack self-worth. I don't think I'm a terrible runner. I'm just like perfect form, mitochondria, perfect form, mitochondria. And I do that for two hours. Not now, I don't do <laughs> two hours, but I will again for two, two to three hours. Uh, perfect form, mitochondria. You know, and even that, you, you know, I'm still, I think maybe a little less, hopefully, but around an inch off in my foot strike. Um, people aren't, why, why aren't runners obsessed with foot strike? Running is physics. And if your foot strike is off, you're not, your ground force return is not going to be ideal. And you're going to expend a lot more energy on your run than someone who has a perfect ground foot force strike, a perfect vector strike of the ground and so don't i don't why would you run an hour why would you run 40 minutes 30 minutes if you don't have a perfect foot strike there's no point to it you're just practicing badly mm -hmm. why would you practice badly and a lot of people can't do a perfect foot strike because they can't even stand on flat-footed right <laughs> right <exactly. laughs> Well, that's what See I how well you trained me. I should get a gold star. You get look how well you trained stars, me. Tim. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's what amazes me with running though. Cause like anything with like OCR skills, lifting, you know, all of that's like, they all have technique. People work on them to get better at them. Like running's no different. There's technique to it. There's important things, aspects to make it more efficient and less injury prone. And yet it's just kind of like, Oh, I, I can just go out the door and run. Like I'm fine. And it, they don't give it a second thought. Um, but yeah, it can be so much easier, so much less painful if we just learn how to do that technique better. Yeah. It's physics. 
it's just, yeah. it's physics people. And you, you know, so a foot strike is a solution, not a strategy. Right. And, yeah. and that's where we try to gain. Now I could do little spurts during a race and stuff like that. That's strategy, race strategy. Um, but, uh, but a foot strike is a solution. And if you're not working on that, you're off. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, now that we know foot strike is the solution, what are your progressions towards a perfect foot strike? And that's where you need to consult with someone who can walk you through the progressions. If your coach just keeps preaching foot strike or something or cadence or, or vertical oscillation, which is bounce. Okay. But foot strike is cadence. Foot strike is vertical oscillation. Vertical oscillation is just the observable, observable manifestation of foot strike, right? So how are you building that? And what's getting in the way of that perfect foot strike? For me, it was a weak uh, right hammy, mm -hmm. which we've now fixed. Um, I didn't know I had, I mean, I kind of, I guess I should have known I had a re weak right hammy, but I never really tested it to the point where I could truly know. Um, yeah. But how was I going to have a perfect foot strike if I had this re weak right hamstring? And I think it's one of my frustrations as a coach, as a clinician about like when I have conversations with people uh, and they're just like, oh, I'm like, what are you doing to work? Like I'm working on my my running gait, like, well, what are you doing? Or, you know, how'd you decide what to do? It's like, oh, well, I just did these, like, I just searched or I'm just working on, on this. And like, while that's great that someone's working on it, it's like, you don't necessarily know what's causing that in the first place. You don't know what things are going to correct it. And until you know those things, like you can just be wasting your, you could just be wasting your time. Yes. And, you know, you had me doing, I've done single leg RDLs before and I was, I'd fall over when I did it on my right a lot more, but you were like, uh, you're not supposed to fall over more on that right one. <laughs> like we have to fix that. I'm like, oh, I guess so. I just always figured, yeah, I'm a little weaker on that side. And you're like, yeah, you're weaker on that side. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> And it's like, you feel so stupid almost. Cause it's like, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. That's a problem. But, but I am doing my hex bar deadlifts. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and now looking back, it's so silly, but it's, it's only silly now. So I have, I have a, a thing that I use with folks. I say uh, picture a notebook. Because folks will say, look how far I've come. And I say, I don't, I don't like that statement because it, it suggests that you were lost before or you were broken before and now you're kind of fixed, but you're not totally fixed. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Look how far you've come. I like this analogy better. Picture a notebook and before you had either an empty notebook or a notebook filled with incorrect things, right? And it's like, I'd rather someone say, look at my notebook now. Look how many, look how filled the pages are, right? Look how good the knowledge is that's in my notebook. Not look how far I've come. Look how filled my notebook is now. So when I look back at me four years ago, I was doing well, you know, two years ago. I had won, I won races, uh, age group. Um, but my notebook was filled with a lot of incomplete thoughts and mistaken things. When I look at my notebook now, it's filled with accuracies. It's filled with complete stories, right? That's, it's the knowledge. It's not look how far you've come. It's look at the knowledge you get possess. Knowledge creates better process, creates better outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need an expert because I don't know this stuff. You do. So I need you to import that knowledge to add to my notebook because if I win worlds, it'll be like, yes, I won worlds because look how filled my notebook is. Right? And yeah. that's in people's control. You can write down facts in a notebook. You can't just be an elite athlete. No one can. 
It's not talent. It's how filled your notebook is. What do you think of that analogy? I like that analogy. That's awesome. And as someone who's there trying to fill people's notebooks, I think that's the work you're doing. In some ways, you're trying to correct the anatomy and anatomical things, but you're also trying to fill people's notebooks. Mm -hmm. Now, people, it's up to you to be coachable. And as a former uncoachable, I can tell you, you better get yourself to be coachable. Whatever Brianne says, do it. <laughs> Shut up and do it <laughs> because she, her notebook is more complete than yours, right? And that's, you can hold them side by side and see how empty your notebook is and how filled her notebook is. Shut up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job of that for being, I, you're, you're uncoachable. You did a great job. <laughs> a former uncoachable. <laughs> and I'm Italian. We don't shut up. <laughs> And I just sit there and listen. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I don't, I still don't really know why you do. I don't, I have a theory because people ask me the same question. Like, do you know our current conceptualization of anxiety and depression are totally wrong and it's ubiquitous throughout the field and it's totally wrong. And the science is there. Like, I'm not just making this up or giving opinion. Um, we know it's increased stress over and over and over again, day after day after day, decreases slow wave sleep, decreases, messes with your macronutritional intake, messes with your motivation, concentration, socialization, more stress, more cortisol, less sleep, right? On and on and on until a point of emotional dysregulation or uh, neuronal degeneration in your frontal lobe as much as loss of a third of volume in your frontal lobe, which can regenerate in only six weeks. I just explained to you basically depression and panic attacks in 30 seconds. Now your audience is like, well, I don't know what the hell he just said, but if you play that back just two or three times, you'll, you'll know exactly what I said. And you have exactly the neurophysiology of depression and anxiety. So people ask, like, how did you come to know that and the field doesn't? And what the research would say is that the more eclectic your learning is and the more decompartmentalized, the more cross-mapped your learning is and the more cross-mapped it is in your brain, the more you make connections. And so if you, if I had a guess, if you look back on your history as, um, as a clinician, you did a lot of eclectic stuff and you really thought about it. And that's where I think you and I have a leg up on other clinicians. Me as a psychologist, you as a physical therapist is you also walk the walk. So, you know, you are a high caliber athlete. So am I. And so I heard this guru sports psychologist dude the other day and I was like, wrong. Yeah, you're right there. Wrong, 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 partially right, wrong, 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 right? And I was just so, I was like, ugh, because you're not, you don't know. You're not an athlete. You haven't put yourself through the ringer. So what do you think? Like, because you somehow get it at such a elegant level. It's hard for other people coming out of PT school to get it to that level. Do you have any guess? Did any of that that I said resonate with you as to why you might get it and other people don't? Yeah, you know, a lot of it did. And I think you're right. It's, um, it is a mix of eclectic education, learning, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of it is my own experiences. Um, part of it, like overcoming injury and kind of experimenting with different things for myself. Um, part of it was when the Vibrams came out on the market, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 years ago now. Like I was a curious clinician. I was like, wonder what these are going to do. So I bought a pair, started running in them and quickly started noticing, like, I didn't need more orthotics anymore. My knees weren't bothering me anymore. And like all these improvements. And so it really got me looking into like, what can our feet do? Like, what are they capable of? And it just really started getting me 
thinking deeper about things of like, why is this stuff missed? Why are we not looking at this stuff? If we can improve this, what else can improve with power, with performance, with speed, with resiliency? And it just kind of caused this whole spiral of just digging deeper to really see what our bodies are capable of if we actually taught them how to move properly. I love it. And that self-experimentation is huge and all of that. And, you know, one last point of this is this isn't about bragging. It, it's, it's really, it's more sadness for our fields that we're just two normal, nobody people, right? Um, who worked hard at knowing our stuff and we know our stuff. Anyone can do it. But, you know, when you exist in a field that so woefully doesn't, it, 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 it's more sadness that just so the audience kind of is pretty clear on this, it's more sadness we're expressing. We're not patting ourselves on the back. It, it really, anyone can do it. And if you're in a field, you know, a, a, whatever field you're in listening to this, get in there, dive into the research, dive into many books, see it from an eclectic perspective so that you can figure out what the solutions are and differentiate it from the strategies and all, see it from the ground up. And you too can transform things and see it for what it is, right? Any of us can do it. Um, but the reason I worked with you and I was just like, whoa, this is what I've been searching for for a long time is because you've done that. It's, it's phenomenal. And you walk through progressions you understand pre-work, work, work post-work. You understand solutions like foot <laughs> versus <laughs> strategies. This isn't a strategy, build your foot, you build your tripod. It's a solution, mm -hmm. right? And you differentiate those things. And you're free to talk strategy too, but you work on a solution level first. That's the pre-work. Yeah. And I think the other thing that comes to mind as you're talking there is once again, it's just being creative and innovative. Like if I'm working with someone and it's like, I need their body to do this and it's not, what do I need to create for them to be able to do that? Like I'll create a film a video and send it off to them. Whereas like most therapists is like, here's my cookie cutter list of exercises. Let's figure out oh, this is strength than hamstrings. Let's just go do this one. And it's really not being effective at all. If it's not truly helping that person improve whatever movement fault is present. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. Yeah. And so let's go, everybody get eight weeks of pre-work going, stop what you're doing, or at least adjunct it. But I would even say, yes, stop what you're doing for a couple of weeks. It's okay. <laughs> you're not going to fall behind. Um, you're Definitely not. not. <laughs> you may just get a little bit faster in the process. Yeah, it just <laughs> probably will. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Tim, this has been an awesome conversation. Great discussion. Um, if someone's interested in finding out more about Impact Being or your company, um, where can they find any of that information at? Yep. So I'm at Timothy Silvestri at Gmail. Uh, that's the easiest way. Just hit me up. I'm always happy to talk to OCR athletes, especially, but I talk to a lot of writers and performers, ballerinas, uh, business people not just athletes, um, but, you know, OCR athletes, you're my peeps. So, you know, I, uh, I, I give away chats for free a lot with some of my OCR folks, but um, reach out, hit us up. And, um, you know, if you, especially if you're, you know, you're missionless and you're floating and it's like, I don't know what's next. And, that's what we do in our company. We, we help people. Mission is aspiration plus impact. We help you define the aspiration that's most, uh, most authentic to you and the impact you're going to make that's most authentic to you. We build that into a mission. And then you just you live a joyful, impactful, amazing life with love and togetherness with people around you. And it, don't wait. To just live that kind of life. It's amazing. And it's right there for the taking, you know, that's what we do. Awesome. And people win gold medals and yes, they win world championships and yes, they win. They have world records. Yes, yes, yes. But come on. It's also about impact. 
Absolutely. Awesome. I love all of that. Well, thank you again so much for your time. This was really fun. Yeah, for sure.